for having led us through such a rich array of songs that display and speak about what we are going to talk about today. And I want to start by asking that have you ever experienced love as a person? Have you ever experienced real love? I'm sure many of us have experienced something as close as real love. Hallelujah. Amen. And what about God's love? Have we come to a place where we've experienced that love as a person? John chapter 3 verse 16 is a familiar text. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And I am aware of real love. I have received love from people like my wife, my children, our children, my mom, my dad. But I am so profoundly grateful for God's love because God has loved me in spite of who I am. In spite of the fact that I'm a wretch, a sinner, a potential object of his wrath. We are sinners. We were supposed to be damned. We should have been in hell. He did need to save us. We did not apply for it. Nobody sat and applied and said, Lord Jesus, come and die for us. But he came. And he loves us. He trusts us with decisions about our lives, choices. He gives us the free will. He risks being rejected by us. And yet still loves us. This love that is more faithful than a mother's love. There's a kindergarten song that we used to sing. It says, Jesus loves me. This side For the Bible tells me so. You want to sing it? <laughs> Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible series on the attributes of God and even though we have already covered many, we are not yet finished. Today we have the joy of looking uh, at another inspiring attribute, the love of God. Praise the Lord. It's not just that God loves us, but it is his very nature to love. It is also his nature that he is love. In nature. Not that God is created because our language is limited. We use the word nature, which connotes creation. But in his nature, in his essence, God does not just love us, but he is love. First John chapter 4, verse 8. God loves us in such a very deep and all-embracing manner that is so different from the warm-hearted sentimentality that often goes around today in the name of love. Google translates love as an intense feeling of deep affection. Did you hear that? An intense feeling of deep affection. What happens when that feeling disappears? Where does the love go? They say it's a great interest and pleasure in something. It is such a twisted view of love that does not even begin to describe the love that God has for us. God's love for us is like the love a shepherd has for his sheep. And the Bible often reminds us that <coughs> Jesus claimed that he is a good shepherd. Praise the Lord. And the shepherd guides the sheep. And many times as a shepherd, and I grew, I grew up in a community of shepherds. In Tesla, we are shepherds. We have cattle, we have sheep, we have goats. 
And many times, these animals have their own ideas. You want them to go a certain place, they will decide to go another way. But the psalmist understood in Psalm 23, he said, you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Let me ask you a question. A rod is a stick. And when you are hit with a stick in our culture, discipline starts with a stick, kiboko. Okay? When you are hit with a stick, it's not pleasant. It's very painful. But David understood to the point that he calls that comfort. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And I call them by name. And I lead them out. In Uganda, in Africa, a shepherd is behind the animals. In Israel, in the Jewish tradition of shepherds, the shepherd is in front and the sheep is behind. They follow him. He speaks. He talks. He makes noises and they listen to that noise and they follow him. There is such a deep longing in every human heart that craves for exp to experience a love that is so transcendent, a love that is superior, a love that is so unequal and unmatched. Every heart desires to be loved. There is no human being who says, I don't need love. Even those who say they are officially single, <laughs> they desire to be loved. But unfortunately for us today, Love has been mismanaged. The depth of the meaning of the word love has been stripped. In countless ways and in contemporary culture, love is expressed in a very demeaned manner. We look at love in a superficial romanticism, very sentimental. When a guy comes to, you know, to a girl, he's like, I'm interested in you. It is that love. I have feelings for you. Is that love? Somebody said that when we say I love you today, it's not the real love. It simply means I am lasting after you. I'm interested in your things. I'm interested in your money. I'm interested in sleeping with you. That is the perception that love has been reduced today. The concept of love has been demeaned. Ladies and gentlemen, men and women love us because of, because of something we have, because of our looks, because of something they want to get from us. But God loves us in spite of it. Hallelujah. God's view of love has not been cheapened. Our view of love is cheapened, but God has not cheapened his love. And this is God's love. The Bible teaches that God's love is far different and greater. First John chapter 4 verse 9. It gives us a model with respect to what the love of God is. First John chapter 4 verse 9, if you're there, 9 to 10. It says this. This is how God loved, showed his love among us. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Hallelujah. Amen. This is how God showed love. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. Love is not feelings. Love is action. Love is giving. And not just giving something that you want to get rid of. It's giving the very best. The best of the best. This is love, John says in the same text. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Praise the Lord. A theologian and a Christian writer called Wayne Gruden, and I know Pastor Jimmy loves Wayne Great Gruden, and I also love him. He says of love, he says of God's love, he says this, 
God's love means that God eternally gives of himself to others. In other words, the total sum of who God is, all the attributes that we have studied about God, that we will ever know about God in this life, God downloads all that and gives it to you and to you and to me. Praise the Lord. Another theologian, uh, R.C. Sproul, says this about love. And he says this, that when we are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we have the capacity for this supernatural love. Because God's love is not natural to us. We are naturally rebellious towards God. And therefore the things of God are not in us. And until we receive Christ as our Lord and our Savior, until God comes and makes a home in us, we have no capacity to love until there is some form of regeneration in us, until our hearts are transformed, until the Spirit of God activates that love. We have no capacity to love. Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, says that, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Just in the nick of time, while we were powerless to save ourselves, God sent his son and he died for us. Hallelujah. We all long to be healed. We all long to be loved. We all long to be blessed. We all long to be in the presence of God, to do godly things. But my brother and my sister, do you love? Do you have the love of God? And part of loving is to forgive. Jesus put a condition that if you do not forgive those who hurt you, my Father in heaven will not forgive you. And Paul said that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because they are filled with his love. They are like Jesus Christ. They have received Christ into their hearts. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 19. And then we will see how deep this love is, how wide and how broad. Paul says a prayer. He prays for the church. He says, My prayer is that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that he, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the depth, the length, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge, that he may be filled with all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. How big is God's love? How deep is God's love? How big is it in your life? Are you able, like Jesus, the good shepherd, to leave the 99 and go for the one? God's love is enduringly strange. It's very imposingly strong. Christ is able to pick a nobody like me, a nobody like you. He qualifies us who are unqualified. The rejected, the drunkard, the prostitute, the very objects of the wrath of God. He makes us not just somebody, but he makes us into children of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. How wonderful. First John chapter 3 verse 1. John marvels at the love of God. He says how deep the Father's love for us. How grand, how vast, beyond measure, that we, wretched sinners, should be called children of God. You are a child of the King. You are not your own. Hallelujah. And I would like us to break that down a little bit. Let's go beyond and, and try to describe this undescribable love. God is indescribable. He is unlimited. He is unbound. And so is his love. And I want to share with you this. Number one, God's love is universal. 
And this is the supremacy of the nature of God's love that while cultures and civilizations and even people teach us that our kind, our skin, our language, our norms and our cultures are more superior than others and therefore worthy of such love. I am from Teso, therefore I should love mostly the people from Teso. We are taught this. I am a black guy, I should, I should love myself more. I should love my people more. When a white person is in the community, I shouldn't really. I am a white person, when a black person is there, we are taught this disinclined view, this demeaning, even racial and tribal resentfulness of other skin colors that God created, of other cultures that God is in, of other languages that God himself created at the Tower of Babel. We reject other traditions, but God's love, in contrast, is very universal. Again, John 3, 16, we know it by heart. For God so loved the world. He did not love the eaters. He did not love only the trolley. He did not love only the white man. He loved everyone, the whole world. He loved everyone. That he gave his son. Love is about giving, and God is a giver. He loved everybody, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're pink, colored. Whoever believes in him, whoever receives this love, whoever receives Jesus, because Jesus is a gift to us. Jesus is a love offering that God has given to us who are unworthy. Whosoever believes may not perish, but have eternal life. When you receive the love of God, you enter into a contract of keeping alive because of his love. It is his love that keeps us alive. Somewhere John the Apostle in 1 John says that we pass from death to life because we love our brother. And so love brings life. Hatred brings death. Number two, God's love is everlasting. And this is very necessary. Another theologian called Arthur Pink puts it. He says that God himself is eternal. Therefore, every attribute about God is eternal. God's love, therefore, is also eternal. It has no beginning. Hallelujah. How awesome is that? How cool is that? We didn't apply for this love. Jeremiah 31, God was speaking to the, to the prophet Jeremiah 31 verse 3, he said, I have loved you, Israel, with an everlasting love. And I have drawn you with loving kindness. Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus in uh, chapter 1 verse 4, he says, according he, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, before the world was created, before you and I were created, before Adam even fell, God knew all these things. Before the foundation of the earth, of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. In him, in him, in his love, having been predestined. We are predestined. We are given that portion, even before we were created. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That should make someone scream. Number three, God's love is inseparable. And that is a, a very conditional assurance for us. God's love cannot be divorced from him. Oh, he's giving of it. Hallelujah. To those who receive his love, to them, he gave the right to be called the children of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul in Romans 8, and I like this guy, Paul, he raises such a deep theological question. He says, who can separate us from the love of God in Christ? Then he tries to enumerate the fears of men. He tries to ask questions. He says, shall trouble, shall hardship, shall persecution, shall famine, shall nakedness, shall danger or sword? And then has to think to himself, 
he realizes that the love of God is as conquering as God himself. He realizes that God's love has victory over elements in the past, in the present, in the future. Amen. And so then Paul declares that no, in all things, we are more than what? Conquerors through Christ who loved us. And then he says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height or depth, or anything in all creation will be able to separate you and you and you, all of us, from the love of God, which is in Christ is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Number four. God's love is praiseworthy. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 to 8. Paul says that very, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love. Praise the Lord. I want, if you don't get anything from this uh, teaching, I want you to get this, that love is not just saying I love you. It's not feelings. It's giving. It's action. It's demonstration. And God demonstrates his love, his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. Hallelujah. If you knew how filthy you were, because God says even your righteousness alone is like filthy rags. Have you ever seen a filthy rag on the street? That is our righteousness. What about our wickedness? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We were so ungodly, unrighteous, so deceased in our crime, so hostile towards God, but God in compassion loved us. Another theologian called John Piper, whom I also love very much, says this about love. He says that this is how we know anyone loves us. Number one, he says that we know the depth of someone's love for us by what costs them. Hallelujah. If someone sacrifices their life for you, then you know that that is a sincere, deep love. It's unequal to any. Husbands, we are called to deeply love our wives the way Jesus loves the church. That means when it comes to a point where you should lay down your life, you have to lay it. I had a cousin brother many years ago when I was young. On Christmas morning, he got murdered. The wife, apparently, used to do witchcraft and poisoning people in the village. I was young, so I don't know whether that was true or not. And so some people were hired to kill the wife. So when the killers came, he knew why they had come. Because word had already gone around before even the murder happened. And uh, so when the killers came, they said, we have come for this lady. We come for Margaret. He said, no. Margaret is my wife. If you want Margaret, pass through me. So they hacked him to death while Margaret was watching. And then they picked Margaret also and hacked her to death. And I think as much as gruesome that is, his love for his wife was so deep. Even with his knowledge of what the wife did. Hallelujah. Second thing John Piper says about love is that we know the depth of someone's love for us by how little we deserve it. How little did we deserve the love of Christ? If we, are, if we treat somebody well in life, okay? If I treat anyone of you here in life, I would expect some love from you. But if I treat you, I offend you, I shun you, I disdain you, I backbite you, I you know, I do all sorts of evil towards you. But yet again, you give your life for me. That is an amazingly deep love, isn't it? Where sin increased, 
Paul said, grace increases the more. That's the love of God. The third thing John Piper says about this is that we know the depth of someone's love for us by the great greatness of the benefits we receive in being loved by them. In other words, if you if you are helped to accomplish a very hard task, you will feel loved in one way. If you are helped to get a job, you feel loved in a certain way. If you are helped to escape the oppression of captivity or given freedom for the rest of your life, you feel loved in a very different way. But brothers and sisters, when you are rescued from eternal torment and given a place that you did not deserve in the presence of Almighty and Holy God, a place for you and me forever, that love is so great. How great is that love? Lavished upon us. We are children of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Fourth and last thing John Piper talks about is we know the depth of someone's love for us by the freedom by which they love us. Hallelujah. Love is as deep in comparison to its liberty. Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life, and life in fullness. Then he says another thing in John 10, 18. He says that nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord, by my own will and authority. I give it. Nobody is making me do it. We did not apply for anything. Did any archbishop, any pope apply it to heaven? No. The love of God was given free. I don't know how much time I have, but I'll just try to limit what I want to share today. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God's love is very sovereign. God himself is sovereign. He has no obligation whatsoever to nobody. He's the Lord to himself. In our culture and traditions, we would call him a dictator. But he is the king of kings yeah. and a lord of lords. Yeah. And he always acts according to his own imperial pleasure. Nobody tells him what to do. We cannot tell God how to love us. We can tell our spouse. Honey, please pick the children. Honey, I want chocolate. Take me out to Matheson's Falls or something. We can do that with our spouses, but with God. That is why it's so dangerous for us when we are hit by trials and temptations that God allows our path in life. It's so dangerous for us to say, God, but why me? Because God has authority over you and I. Hallelujah. God's love, number six, is living. Number six, God's love is living and manifest. Past John chapter four, verse nine to eight, uh, to 10. It's manifested in Jesus Christ himself, that he showed his love for us when he sent his son. Number seven, the love of God is limitless. His love is infinite. His love is immeasurable. His love is so unbound, it's everlasting. Praise the Lord. Just like every attribute of God is unbound, God is rich in wisdom. His wisdom is illimitable. He fills the heavens and the earth. His power is boundless. And so his love in the same way has no limit. Praise the Lord. Scientists have discovered that when if, if the sun were to move one inch, how big is an inch? This big, I think. Very small. If the sun were to move, if the earth were to move an inch towards the sun, we would all melt in seconds. Everything would melt. If it moved away just one inch, one little tiny inch like this, we would all freeze to death. How powerful is that? How awesome is the love of God? 
and the power of God. Number eight, God's love is unchangeable. I mean, unchallengeable. James chapter 1, verse 17. You'll read this later. As with God himself, there is no variableness. There is no shadow. There is no turning. He does not say, now I don't love you. No. Number nine, God's love is sacred and sanctified. Hallelujah. <coughs> he, God's love is not regulated by compulsion like ours. God's love is not regulated by passion or sentiments or feelings, but by principle, standard, or code. God lives by a particular code. Romans 5, uh, verse 21, Paul said this. He said that, so that a sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And just as grace reigns, not at the expense of righteousness. So God's love also never conflicts with any other tribute, with his holiness. Hallelujah. Amen. Hebrews 12 verse 6 says that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he rebukes, he reprimands, he scourges, he terrorizes. Do you know that God can bring terror Moses called, uh, not Moses, um, David, I think, called him the dread of Jacob. The dread of Jacob. He can bring terror. We say that these uh, uh, Muslims are terrorists. That's nothing. God is the real terrorist, if he means to terrorize. But he does so in love, to chasten us, to put us back in line, to grow us in him. To fill us with his love. Hallelujah. Amen. Number 10, God's love is gracious. Christ died in order that we may become his people filled with his love. How great the Father's love for us. Number 11, God's love is perfect. Praise the Lord. Amen. First John chapter 4, verse 18. says this perfect love casts out fear. God's love is perfect in that it drives out fear. Hallelujah. When God loves you, there is no fear in him. When you know God loves you, there is no fear in you. Fear of punishment of sin. You are redeemed. You are loved. You are wanted. You belong. When men reject us, we feel so bad. But do you know who first felt rejection? Go to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. You will find a guy, the person who, who, who was rejected first. God's love is so priceless in nature. Even in the nature of its of, in spite of our flaws, in spite of our, you know, weakness. God's love is so protective. Number 12, which is really, for now, the last thing I want to share with you is that God's love is jealous, very jealous. There are women who are jealous. Hey. <laughs> there are women who are very jealous. They have some women. Even men are very jealous. There are people who have reached an extent of killing. There are those who have used witchcraft on their spouses. God's love is Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. Can someone read that? As I drink this water, someone read. <coughs> Exodus 34, 14. You shall worship no other God, for the Lord his name is jealous, is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. His love is jealous. If you want to love God, better love only God. Don't bring another idol there. We are in danger of idolatry. Many times we want to box our understanding of God in a corner. We think we have known God. But we can never know God fully. God is so big. 
Israel made a very dangerous thing and made a calf. They boxed him into a calf, into a golden image. And he sent them some very swift and serious judgment. Hallelujah. Amen. What are the implications of God being a God of love to us? I have five implications here. There are more probably. <clears throat> One of them is that God's great love for us compels us, therefore, to love him. You'll read this at your own time. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for Jesus. We are compelled, we are obligated, we are required, we are commanded to live for Jesus. Number two, God's love for us compels us to trust in him. Why do we trust him? Because we are convinced that no man, no one man or animal was as sufficient as Christ, our all-encompassing sufficient Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Number three, God's great love for us compels us to submit to him. His love takes a grip on us. When we are filled with the love of God, we become something else. We become fanatical. Do you remember the days when you first gave your life to Jesus? When you had received the sweet love, you were fanatical, isn't it? You wanted to tell everybody, like the woman at the well. Jesus told her about her life and she ran away screaming in the town of Samaria and saying, come and see the guy who told me everything I've ever done. There's a lot. My timer is now on. Come and see the, the man who has told me everything. We become fanatical. It compels us to submit to him. It holds us accountable to him. We no longer live for ourselves. We live for him. Hallelujah. Number five, and this is very important. God's love compels us, you and I, to love our neighbor. Remember the commandments that Jesus uh, spoke to the young rich man? Say, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Love these guys who are neighboring you. Who is your neighbor? The neighbor. It's not a physical neighbor. Eh? Praise the Lord. I have a friend who calls me neighbor because now we are apparently becoming neighbors. But we've been neighbors all along. <laughs> but at least by the definition of Christ. We have passed from death to life because we love one another. That's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, 17. The last one. Well, second last one. God's, God's love compels us to love our enemies. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I would have loved us to read this because it's really very important. Mama Pastor, do you want to read that? Like very fast. I know you're a fast reader. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 36. These people want to go away. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 36. It's about 9 or more. Luke 6, 27, 26. Love your enemies. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to the other side. Uh, to the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would, love, you would have them do for you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love you. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect payment, 
What credit is that to you? Even sinners learn to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Hallelujah. Amen. That is an indictment to us. Isn't it? How many of us can do that to an enemy? <laughs> that you can love an enemy, the person who has just loved you. How many, Moses, I know you. You are a man like me, and you are from Peso. Iteso will not entertain a slap. <laughs> However small he is and you are big, you dare to slap him, he will slap you back at least. But Jesus is giving a totally different definition of love here. It's so deep. I want I, I pray that you will go and just read this and meditate on it. Think about it. Think about those who are your enemies. What have you been doing to them? And do what Jesus said. We all need to do this. Hallelujah. Sometimes somebody comes and takes money from you a debt. They don't pay. Jesus said, let it go. Let it go. Why? Because you have an account. You, it will be credited to you. What credit is it that you love only those who love you? Even sinners do what? They do the same. If I call one of you here to my home and prepare a meal for you, even sinners do that. Jesus is essentially saying, go and get a sinner, a witch doctor, bring him to your house, cook him a meal in Jesus' name, and let him eat it. Make friends with everyone. Of course, be careful. Okay? If I am standing here, and another person is standing where I'm standing, and we do a, a tag wall pulling, guess who will be pulled down? Do you know who will be pulled down? Is it? The one who is here, you are a Christian, you are here. The world is here where I'm standing. Be careful. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to invite you now, especially those who do not know Jesus Christ. As your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you as I end. Jesus said to Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, verse 3, he said, truly, truly, I tell you, unless you are born again, Born again is not a denomination. Born again is not being Catholic or Protestant or what. Born again is just a condition that allows you to have access to God and the kingdom of God. And unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. Praise the Lord. The better we are acquainted with the love of God, the character, the blessedness of that love, the more our hearts are drawn to Jesus. And the more we get drawn to Jesus, the more we become like him. Now does this truth that we have shared now, how does it impact you? How does it change you? How does it make you a better person to please God? Praise the Lord. That love invites us today. Even those of us who have given our lives to Jesus. That love invites us back to him this morning. That we pour our lives to him. That we give our all to him. To receive him as supreme Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody did say this. That the name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua means Savior. And imagine Jesus running around as a kid and they call him Savior. Have you eaten? Savior, where's your mother? And today, Savior is here. He's calling us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord, have thy own way. Can we rise up and we pray? If there's anybody here, any man, 
Any woman who does not know Jesus, I will not ask you to raise your hand. I will not ask you even to come here. Because Jesus 